Hi everybody, we're just waiting for everyone to, to log into today's session and uh, we'll make a start shortly. Okay, so uh, let's make a start. I'm sure others will join as the session continues. So welcome everybody to uh, another series of our, our REVA digital session. So today uh, our session is focused on solving collaboration challenges across industries. And uh, I'm excited to announce our, our talkers today, speakers rather. We have Tim Lockett from, from Whitehead Building Services and Josh Cole from Jacobs, who are going to be talking to us about their use of Robusto for, for completely different um, reasons, which I quite enjoy actually working with these guys and hear of their innovative use of our technology for uh, collaboration, but as, as the title says, across various different projects. So we've got linear, uh, horizontal, sorry, and vertical projects all within Robusto, and you'll get to see that in action today. Uh, and then that'll be finished up with a a bit of a sneak preview into what we've got coming in version five, which we're now only a few weeks away from making available, followed with a Q&A for, for today's panelists. So first of all, I just want to, to make sure that everybody can hear me and see my screen okay before we continue. So for those of you that haven't used Zoom previously, then you can uh, add a comment or ask a question. So let's start with uh, asking you guys a question. Where are you dialing in from today? Uh, either you can put in uh, the name of the location or company name, whatever it is that, that you prefer to tell us, and that will let me know that you can hear me okay. And then I'll continue. So if you just put in the name of your company or where you're based, that'd be great. And look like, there we go, some are coming through. Oh, well, quite an international audience. So Frankfurt. Australia, New Zealand. Wow. Okay. So thanks for staying up. Uh, and there we have somebody from, from Wimbledon. Fantastic. So again, thank you for taking the time to, to dial into today's session. We hope you, you find it useful. So just a few, um, few points for myself, and then I'm going to jump straight into or hand the mic over to, to Tim. So for those of you that aren't aware of Bravisto, then there's just some numbers for you to take a look at. We're actually still growing rapidly right across the world now with just shy of 120,000 active users, almost close to 20,000 active projects, and you know the tool continues to develop month on month, it seems, and all of that, the development work is driven by you, our clients. So it's a pleasure to be able to work with such interesting clients and provide you with the technology that's adding value, value to, to your projects. Just a, a, a slide there to show you some of the, the people that we're working with. And it ranges as, and which is quite poignant to, to this rev up across industries, across different organizations, then no matter what you're doing in the construction space, we can help you communicate and collaborate in, in, in a better way using our integrated collaboration platform throughout the whole project life cycle to, to create, manage and track project based tasks effectively and the guys will show you this in a bit more detail and why you should be using uh, you know, an integrated collaboration platform on, on your project. So with that being said, I've talked enough so let's jump straight into it with uh, with yourself Tim from, from Whiteheads. Morning Tim, how are we? Hello, all right, thanks very much. I'll just, That's all right, uh, we're doing this uh, 
bit too often recently. So Tim was actually part of the the Bim Alliance team that talked at an event last last week or the week before last. So thanks for for joining us, Tim. Um, if you uh, if you want to share your screen, looks like it's coming through. Perfect. And yep, socially distant collaboration uh, from from Tim Lockett. So over Hi. to you, Tim. I'm there, I think. Uh, hopefully, you can all see the, the Whitehead logo. Oops. Oh, done clear. There we go, mate. Perfect. All right. Yeah, um, as Reese said, actually, this 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 presentation is slightly recycled. Uh, we're in a circular uh, circular economy these days. Um, so it's one that I did did uh, with Reese a few weeks ago, um, but we thought we'd sort of recycle it a bit. Um, but I'm going to look more at the actual technology of Revisto rather than some of the other stuff. So I'm kind of going to whip through the slides a bit and and then come on to Revisto, give a bit of a demonstration of the sorts of things we're, we're doing and, and using it for. So um, the, the theme of the previous presentation uh, was more about sort of coping with COVID and, and how we've used these technologies um, you know, during lockdown for sort of remote working and that kind of thing. So that, that's perhaps why the, uh, the, <laughs> the, the presentation takes on this thing. Um, just as again, as another bit of background for you, um, I'm actually at my, my in-laws farm at the moment, um, working from home there. Uh, my father-in-law is in a barn just behind my window trying to fix his tractor. So if you hear some uh, quite loud expletives while if it breaks something, uh, do apologize for that. No, no. Um, no apology go. needed, mate. We look forward to getting <laughs> that tractor firing up in a couple of minutes, hopefully. Yeah, and, and <laughs> there, that mower is gonna go. Right, anyway, um, so, as a bit of background, um, seeing those those names come through from from Frankfurt and, and New Zealand, Australia. One from Cardiff, though. Hello to you. Um, Whitehead Building Services. Um, we are Mechanical Electrical Public Health MEP Building Services contractor, um, predominantly based in sort of South Wales and the southwest of England. Um, our head office is Newport in South Wales. Um, we've also got locations in Bristol, Exeter, and then Redruth down in Cornwall. Um, we operate in a number of sectors, quite widely spread, public, commercial, residential, rail. We also have our own maintenance department. Um, and again, just, just for sort of an idea of scale, as who we are, uh, turnover in round figures around 40 million, and, and we employ directly about 300 staff. Um, I myself work from the South Wales head office in Newport near Cardiff. Um, so there's just a selection of a couple of projects I'm, I'm personally working on. Again, just to give you an idea of the sort of shape and size and scale of things that we would do. Uh, top one there is the Cardiff University. That's sort of a research and teaching building. Uh, a few labs, uh, lecture theatres, um, seminar spaces, that sort of stuff. Uh, that's with Boyd Construction. Um, it's around... Um, so for those that don't speak Welsh, um, oh, let's just say my internet connection is unstable, so hopefully you can still hear me. Um, you can make the upload and clear. So for those that don't speak Welsh, that's, that's a school in the Vale of, of uh, Glamorgan, that's in Barry. Um, again, secondary school, part new, part refurb, total project value, they're 18 and a half million. Um, and then that one at the bottom there is Kevin Sison School in Neath uh, it's with Morgan Sindel. Again, a secondary school. That's a new build. Project value is around 29 million. Um, I'm actually going to, towards the end of this presentation, dive into the Revisto model for that school and sort of show you around a little bit. In terms of, of Whitehead, again, um, we are an MEP contractor. We have our own in house design and BIM team. Uh, generally, we uh, the, the design up to the sort of feasible generic model. So what we used to call stage 4A, uh, we would receive um, either, either as a, a sort of a, a project brief. So, so someone's done that before and we've tendered on it and inherited it, or we would outsource that to a, a local MEP consultant. Um, and then from that point onwards, once that, that feasible generic model is done, uh, we would take that on um, typically in Revit, obviously, um, and 
so from stage 4b onwards we, we do that in-house with our own staff we've got six permanent staff um our bim team are predominantly office based uh, but during stage five construction phase uh, we do up to sort of sometimes have them based on site um and again i'll probably talk to you a bit about a bit more about that later um i'm the design manager for whiteheads uh, so i sort of supervise that whole whole team as I say, um, the, the previous title for the presentation was kind of coping with COVID and how we're uh, managing with lockdown. So um, onto those kind of things, really. Uh, first top tip, um, get yourself a massive telly, really, is, is the top tip for that. That's the one I've taken from my kid's room. That's the 32-inch TV. And that's actually my daughter there having a little look around the National History Museum, courtesy of the, the good people at Revisto who've let, let us have a, a little look at that one. Um, it seems a bit of an obvious one in terms of coping with lockdown. We're doing it now, but um, video conferencing, the likes of team, Zoom, screen sharing, to be able to sort of pop a model up on the screen and give someone a call on site and, and fly around and show them what they should be doing has been invaluable, really. Um, I'm sure you've found the same sort of things yourself with your own meetings. Um, as, a, as a bit of an illustration as to sort of how powerful the video conferencing has been uh, towards the start of the lockdown period uh, whiteheads were called up um, by Morgan Sindel construction and asked uh, if we could help them out with this particular project uh, Bluestone is a holiday village um, and it sits in Tenby sort of in West Wales uh, and the, the image on the left there is their indoor play centre or at least it was um, and then purely through you know, design and collaboration over the video conferencing um, we've turned it to those images on the right there which is now a, a, a hospital essentially and that the, the main hall has got 80 beds in it um, not that I think I don't actually think anyone's using it at the moment but um, you know let's in some ways let's hope it stays that way um, another item that we've been using um, is a BIM 360 from Autodesk. Uh, it does do a, a number of things, but really all we've been using it for um, is a, a Revit cloud work sharing. So rather than having our Revit models hosted on our own servers and then kind of VPN in and out again, um, it, you, it allows us to store those Revits on the cloud and then just download and it's just our sync times instead of waiting 20 minutes for something to come off the server, we can do that in two minutes and it's just been really useful. Um, to come on to Revisto, really. Um, so what I might do is take you off here. Oops, not like that, like that, and show you Revisto model. The first point I've got on there is, is, is visualization. So there's a, there's a few useful points that we like to use about Revisto. Hopefully you can see now the Kevin Sison School model. Um, as I was saying about visualization really is one of the, the, the key selling points for us it's really very very easy to use um, and very quick as well I can bring up this model here as you see it's very easy to just sort of have a little fly around that kind of thing I can pull a section through however I want um, I'm sort of assuming that people listening to this uh, be a mixture of people some people will know how to use Revisto and have used it um, I guess some people are sort of just kind of trying to get an idea of whether they want to use it. But um, for our guys, it's been really useful. Um, we, we've got, as I said, we, we've got sort of six design staff um, who are kind of been trained, if you like. Uh, but then we've got, we've got sort of maybe 20 people using Revisto at the moment. Um, and they range from sort of all the site managers, project managers, those kind of people that have not necessarily ever had any kind of BIM training or experience. Um, and as I say, one, one, of the, one of the really key points about Revisto for us is that I, I can take people, uh, as an example, I've, I've, we started a project, the Isgol Broma Gamut project in Barry. Um, uh, these two guys probably aren't listening in now, so I can, I can probably say it, but I think they'd admit it themselves. They're uh, a little older in their years. Um, they, 
they've been working on some refurb projects in the last five to ten years and haven't been, they, they kind of admitted at the start of that project that BIM has almost sort of passed them by. Um, but we kind of said to them, look, you know, you don't have to learn Revit, you don't have to learn anything, you know, particularly difficult here. Um, we've got, you know, we'll, we'll, we'll show you a Visto. Um, I gave them a half an hour tutorial and really after that they started whizzing around the thing and they, they found it invaluable they you know they, they're using it all the time now um just for sort of you know, looking at things measuring things and, and it's just a really useful link between them and the bim guys um i'm just gonna open one of my saved views not like that i'm not uh, one of my saved views where I've just coloured in all the MEP services because that's obviously the part of the building that I'm the most interested in. So um, it's quite, again, I'm not going to treat this as a tutorial of how to do stuff, but it's, it's pretty simple to uh, click on this item here and choose, for instance, cable trays. I want them blue, air terminals, I want them green. And you can save it as a viewpoint the way I've just done and then get back to that at any point. Um, so that's what I've done. And I can sort of fly through the building here. I've obviously cut it down at the ground floor ceiling void level. So as um, again, I can see all my services are the kind of things I want. Um, I've heard that in the forthcoming Revisto version five, um, as well, I don't know if there are any MEP people listening, but one, one of the items that I, I particularly wanted um, is that, so at the moment I can color in these pipes. Um, but it's a simple matter of well, pipes are coloured in purple and all pipes are the same. Um, I've heard that in Revisto 5 you can sort of uh, colour them in different ways. So for instance, a hot pipe is red and a cold pipe is blue or something like that. So that's a, something that... More coming should... from Lewis later on. Yeah, so, um, I, I don't want to, to steal his thunder or anything like that. Now. Oh, so that's fine. Spoil any surprises coming up. But, um, as, I say, <laughs> <laughs> as I say, it's... it's the, the main selling point for us is the pure simplicity of it. You know, you can cut stuff about, colour it in, and then quite easily go and have a wander around the building, a little look down, see if there are any coordination clashes, um, which I think was the next point on my slides, um, see if there are any coordination clashes, and then make a note to fix them, basically. Um, I can show you just how easy it is to spot any items. Yeah, let's just for instance, um, let's for instance say that I didn't want that tray there. I want it over here. Um, very easy. This is a live project, so click create an issue, stick it on the tray, type in here, move tray to uh, left. Only if I can type, obviously. I'm going to change that to right as well, and then I could add a little arrow or something like that or even add a little diagram as to where I want it done that pops up there as an issue I can assign it to someone Reese is our uh, Revit guy that's working on this one um, the other thing I like to use is these tags so the, these are sort of bespoke tags that I've typed in myself so you know this particular issue is electrical containment, so I'm going to tag it as electrical containment. Um, if I wanted to, I could call it something, I could add a new tag of whatever name. Um, and then basically what, what we do with that, then Reese gets Reese gets it on his screen next time he logs into Revisto. I believe he gets an email as well, or a little ping somewhere. Um, and next time he comes on, he, it's as simple as he opens up his list of things to do and starts working on them. Um, a really useful point, which I can't show you at the moment because I haven't got Revit open, would have been good. But um, when if you've got Revit open and you've got Revisto open at the same time in an issue, it's as simple as Reese can double click this issue and it will open up Revit at the point in the same view as the issue has been created. So all he needs to do is, is just double click that, have a little look at Revisto, have a look at his Revit, and move it in the way that it's been asked. And as soon as he does that, he can then go, solved. I'll then get a little message to say, Reese has done this, 
I can go in, make sure it's been done. He could type a little thing out as well. You know, there's a little chat in here, so he could write a little message, possibly to say, I can't do it that way. I need to do it another way or something like that. Um, and then as soon as I've seen it, I can go in there and say, right, okay, that's fine. That one's closed. Um, before I move off this one, I'm going to try and delete it. <laughs> open it up again. And there we go. I am going to forget if I don't delete that there. So let's just delete that one. Otherwise, Reese is going to move that tray. So there we go. Um, then you can obviously see a few of the other issues, the sort of things that I've, I've put on there. Um, you can do it in 2D or 3D. Uh, that's another really sort of useful thing for us. Um, you know, a lot of the site managers prefer to work in 3D because because that sort of their background is is being out there on site and and, and seeing it and doing it. Um, my own background is in M&E consulting. Um, so I'm quite used to sitting looking at 2D drawings. So it's, it is possible to um, to import your, your 2D drawings in Revisto, uh, which I believe it's, it, you know, it's gives it. Well, I think it gives it an advantage over the likes of Navisworks, um, and you can yeah make a little sketch on your 2D, and again your guys there can can just go and fix things. Um, so yeah, obviously just examples of the sorts of issues that I'm picking up here. Oh, that's another 2D drawing. And then a, another 3D. I've asked you know, for a few things to be changed there. So, so those are the kinds of things that um, we can do. Uh, so in, in terms of visualization, it's very easy to wander around. Um, and then, oh, so on my slide coordination yeah we, we can fly around that we'll quite often have meetings um over teams at the moment but you know even when we're in the same room we'll be sat in a meeting room with, with this on the on a big screen and we'll go around um and perhaps do a sort of a clash detection type thing um you know with a bunch of people site managers and, and designers all sort of sat together collaborating together um one another useful feature that we use uh, is the reporting feature so if we if we're doing one of these clash detection workshops uh, it might not be an internal thing it might be also involving our um our, our clients they're the main contractors um so so you know we could produce quite very simple very quick to produce quite a fancy looking report so here's one i made earlier that tractor's just fired up i don't know whether you can hear that um here's is a report that we've done fairly easy it it almost is as easy as when you're in the issue tracker click on reports there set your report up stick a few parameters in so for instance if we were to do a clash detection workshop today i raised 10 issues I can go into that report, set it up so as it just brings up issues that were raised today. And then within a minute, I get something like this emailed to me. Um, it's got a nice little title page, just looks really good, you know, for your the clients to look at it. And it just brings up really simple screenshot and uh, very simple description, anything that you did type in there to show what needs doing. Um, you can use this to kind of document the meeting or, you know, you can also use these reports. You can set them up to come weekly. So for instance, um, you know, for, for instance, I, I could have any, any open issues that I've got my child looking in at the window. Go away a minute, will you? <laughs> um, Ready to go for a ride on the track there. You better hurry up. Yeah. <laughs> um, so, where was I? Yeah. So, for instance, I could set set a report up to deliver every Monday morning for Reese Williams, our, our BIM guy on this particular project, any open issues, and he will get an email with a report like this um, on his desk Monday morning uh, for him to start flicking through and solving those problems, whether he likes it or not. Um, so, yeah, back into Revisto then. Um, what else does I want to tell you about? 
model QA. Yeah, so in, in a sort of a, a way, I've touched on it there, the issue tracker kind of works for me as, as almost like a, a good sort of QA system. Um, I showed you that, uh, you know, the, the, the status of it could go from open to closed, for instance, and then, you know, we, we have a system within within Whiteheads where you know, someone opens a issue it gets solved by the Revit guys, and then the project, you know, and, clo and the project manager or the person that raised the issue then has to go back and close it to say that it's been solved in a satisfactory sort of way. Um, again, really easy to kind of filter these sorts of things out. You know, you can pick any issue that's open or in pro or anything that's in progress or anything that's already been solved. Um, you can choose them by date. You can choose them by who reported them. Now, all sorts of things like that. Um, again, very, very easy to kind of pick through things and, and sort things out. Um, so that's visualization coordination I talked on. Um, I, I didn't show you while we were in Revisto actually, but that that top image there with a sort of a big red splodge in it is, um, is actually imported from Navis. Um, so those that have ever used the Navis Works Clash Detective, um, it's not, I, I don't find it particularly user friendly, but you can import those clashes. So if, if, if your client, if one of the main contractors or whoever you work for has, has done a clash detection, you can bring it into Revisto and make it a lot easier to deal with. Um, and QA, I've just talked about a little bit. The, the site communication sort of side of it, we've actually been out and bought two or three iPads and sort of taken them around to the sites. Um, and as I said, it's very easy for, for our site guys with, with minimal training to just sort of wander about the site with an iPad and kind of it'll work works both ways in that they can get information out of our BIM model for instance, the image on the right there shows they can quite easily just take a measurement from one place to another. Uh, or the other way around could be that the, the site guys notice something in the model and they can set that up as an issue. For instance, on the on the left there, there's, they want that louver moving um, and then get it back to the, the BIM guys. So, yeah, again, just, just very easy, very simple, very portable to kind of take around with us. I think... That's pretty much it. Yeah, we again coping with COVID, we, we're doing a lot more sort of off site manufacturing, and, and again, Revisto helps us there just sort of get the model right before that all goes, really. Um, and that is about it from me. So, hopefully, that was all right. I noticed a couple of questions. Perfect. Yeah, that's perfect. And thanks a lot. Uh, well, what might do is we've got them now, we will take them. So, uh, how long do you need for the setup for Revisto at the project, and how much time do you spend per person? for a visto per week. Um, how long do I need to set up a project? Yeah, I suppose the project setup, how long does it take you to get a working project set up in Revisto yeah. to invite the, the team? The answer is not very. Um, to be honest, the, the most, the, the longest time that takes is the kind of faffing about in Revit to start with. It's as simple as open your project in Revit, uh, create a 3D view, um, make sure that uh, you can also you can also export it from things like Navis and, and other other programs as well. But I just we use Revit. Um, mm. set, set up your 3D view. Uh, make sure you've got all the things turned on in that view that you want turned on. Um, you know, architect structures, MEP models, all of them are in there. And then click sync. Um, and that's really about as simple as it gets. Um, yeah. Um, the, the the actual syncing of it may take a bit of time, just you know, for the data to sort of go back and forth. But uh, you know, in in terms of person processing time, it, it's probably not much more than about half an hour to to actually get it going. Um, and then in terms of keeping Revisto up to date, uh, you know, you you can set up automatic syncs, which is what we do. Uh, so. Um, depending on what stage the project's at, we'll do it either daily or weekly. So when we're doing a lot of design work, um, 
we will we'll, you know, we'll do it daily. So our Revit guy then will just sort of leave his computer on overnight and he'll, he'll set up a schedule such that at about midnight that night it'll just automatically sync and then he comes in in the morning and, and Revisto is now as up to date as the Revit model is. Looks like the one, uh, we've got another one here actually from one of the guys in Australia that's asking have you started to use the stamp tool yet um, that they've transitioned now from using the pick and position um, icon that you showed that to create a new issue completely to, to stamps. So um, curious if you started using those yet or not. Yeah, um, I personally haven't. Uh, there's other guys that in the organisation have. Um, yes, I understand. You know, for typical typical issues such as um, this socket doesn't line up with the furniture, you could just set up a stamp which says socket doesn't line up with furniture, and you can then yeah. just go quite easily and stamp it on all of the instances for that. Yeah. Exactly. So um, maybe um, Josh may be able to show us some of that now. So, all right, Tim, well, we're running um, uh, spot on on time. So uh, we'll leave you, uh, release you now. So you're going to go and take a ride on, on the BIM tractor. Uh, look forward to seeing some pictures on, on Twitter afterwards. But uh, thanks for sharing your story. Always interesting to, to see what you guys are doing, especially uh, for me, because there, there are a lot of local projects in there as well. So that's great. Thanks a lot, Tim. So mm -hmm. feel free to, to stay on. Um, or. Yeah. Um, Get back to it so we'll speak soon thanks a lot pal thanks cheers so uh josh hello over to you thank you uh hello everyone and um sorry sorry yeah, <laughs> yeah. Thanks. we can hear you which is great um Good. if you yeah. share your screen as well yeah. always smooth transitions these are in, in live presentations <laughs> which is great just realize as well my office door is slightly open so we've had lots of background noise today practice from Tim and I think there's some work going on outside my office as well today so right. I'm hoping anyway. to be a bit quieter hopefully <laughs> no right no problem N nothing exciting um, happening in the background where you are today then is it you don't have a tractor behind you as well <laughs> no no nothing, nothing is exciting with the tractor no. next time anyway over to you Josh thanks a right. lot thank you um hello everyone um I'm Josh Cole I'm um, a project technology coordinator in Jacobs and that's sort of uh, one of our defined roles within our BIM team. Uh, and I sort of primarily deal with the setting up of project environments. So for those that have heard of um, ProjectWise, um, I set up the common, sort of the common data environments there and then help um, manage that uh, alongside other members of our team. And then also, um, Helping the research of uh, different softwares that could be used on projects, and this sort of this is how I've sort of come to Revisto. Uh, I sort of took it on from a Jacob's point of view, and uh, with um, Peter, uh, who's one of the um, members uh, of the Revisto team, um, we've he, he's helped uh, us develop a, a template and deliver training over the course of, of the past few months. Uh, so I'll, I'll just sort of give you a brief overview of, of where Jacobs is in the world. So this is sort of a, a map highlighting all the countries we're in. Um, it's fairly fairly global, as, as it's seen on the map. Uh, we also um, sort of operate uh, intercontinental. So we work quite regularly with our team members in India. So we're not just not you don't we don't just limit ourselves to uh, the same country. Uh, we quite often work with our, our colleagues in India, uh, as well as uh, the ones in Germany. Uh, personally, uh, how I operate in Jacobs, um, I fall under the transportation division, um, and my sort of primary uh, client that, that I deal with is Highways England. Uh, and for those that don't know, they're the um, sort of the governing body uh, for um, uh, maintaining and sort of commissioning the roads within uh, the UK, I'm sorry, sorry, not the UK, uh, within England. Uh, and uh, they, they sort of are our primary client, but we also work quite closely with um, contractors. Uh, so our, we work quite closely with Costain uh, in partnerships uh, and, and quite regularly at the minute, uh, our major projects that uh, I'm certainly involved in. Uh, 
uh, is the Regional Development Partnership, or RDP, uh, which is a, a partnership with Costain. Uh, so we are doing the designing and they are doing uh, the, the, um, the building and such. Uh, and sort of the main main projects from that partnership are uh, um, A1 Scotswood, it's not Brennan, A1 Burtwood Coal House, A12 uh, Winding Scheme and A30 Winding Scheme. And the two I'm mainly involved in are are the two A1 projects, sort of based up in Newcastle. Uh, so, sort of given a, a timeline of, of how we've developed Risto in Jacobs. Uh, so, from sort of initially uh, testing and researching uh, Risto, uh, that was done by uh, other members of our team. Uh, they, they sort of uh, decided that it was viable for us and sort of suited our needs. So over, over the course of, uh, I think it's been a, a couple of years uh, to get to this point, but we've, we've been having meetings with the Revista team and we've had uh, sort of close contact uh, in the recent months, uh, especially with uh, Peter and Reese. Uh, but from that, we, we've uh, sort of uh, made a commitment to start using it on projects and uh, make sure that we sort of have a healthy relationship uh, between ourselves and, and the Visto team. Uh, after we sort of had um, th these initial discussions and continuing uh, discussions with Visto, uh, we then sort of went to our uh, own internal Jacobs leads, who sort of, we, we wanted to get their support um, for, for the, using the software and giving a, a few demonstrations, uh, either by ourselves or with, with help from, from Peter and Reese, um, it, it was soon realized that we, the benefits of, of using Revisto in comparison to just using Navisworks were, um, were, were greatly seen. And uh, from that, we, we then sort of commissioned uh, a creation of a standardized template that we could use across the business, or certainly, um, within uh, the UK transportation. And I'll sort of show you, show you uh, uh, everyone the, uh, how our templates developed and, and what, we've, what we class as, what we standardized in it. So um, as, as Phil has been mentioned, uh, we, uh, Tim mentioned the, the issue uh, tracker, uh, but then Reese met, uh, also mentioned the stamps, which we've gone for the approach of using primarily the stamps and having that standardized across all the disciplines. But again, I'll get, I'll come to that later in the presentation. Uh, after we sort of did the, uh, create the template, we then uh, continue to work on sort of uh, guidance documents and workflows uh, in order to sort of aid our teams in, in sort of helping them use the software. Uh, because as, as any sort of uh, BIM practitioner will, will agree it's it's hard to get people on board with software if the tools aren't there in the first place and we've certainly uh, found that having uh, set guidance and, and sort of the, the support network uh, in place greatly sort of helps that transition uh, between you uh, using old software and, and trying to move on to a new new, new uh, um, uh, piece of software sorry uh, from after we've sort of had the workflows in place and the guidance, we've gone to um, delivering training uh, to project teams uh, and we uh, split this into two. Uh, and I'll, I'll go into that in more detail later. Uh, but once everyone's had the training and uh, given an initial overview, uh, we've started to implement it on live projects. Uh, so I will uh, show you later on um, uh, our live project that we have. Um, uh, that's that we uh, recently uh, had a, a clash detection meeting on last week, and we've got sort of uh, a live a live feed of what's what was shown in there. Uh, so moving on uh, to uh, the development of the standardised template. So we've got our Jacobs transportation template, uh, which covers uh, a variety of disciplines. So um, starting off, we we. Uh, use the stamp function uh, over the issue tracker function. As, sort of, as we consulted with our discipline leads and um, our technical excellence team within Jacobs, 
uh, we went for an approach that needs to include um, all parties and all disciplines involved. Uh, so we've got um, any, any discipline that covers transportation, so we've got aviation, uh, highways, rail, and then all the subsequent disciplines that sort of fall within that, uh, drainage, environmental, uh, geotechnical, structures and technology. Uh, and within those, they all have the same um, set of stamps. Uh, so within, like I said, uh, within the disciplines, they have the stamp set of stamps. And they are sort of, I've just shown the example of the highways ones, but we've got a, uh, a chainage move, uh, an interdisciplinary clash, a horizontal error, a level of detail stamp, a standards check, and a vertical error. And these are sort of just, just to give a general uh, idea of what the stamp is meant to sort of be used for. And then we sort of encourage them within uh, the comment section of the Visto, within the uh, issue tracker, uh, to sort of detail more in there what they want to have changed. And as, as Tim showed earlier, you can uh, draw uh, within the, the issue itself and have a sort of a markup. Uh, so, so like, like Tim showed, if, if it wants to be moved to the left or to the right, it can be, it can be drawn on uh, quite easily and quite simple. And uh, other functions of the comments uh, we found that we use is that you can attach documents. So we can attach um, standard detail markups if we need, or we can also um, attach uh, calculation sheets if we need to as well. Uh, the only sort of uh, category that does differ um, from the disciplines is sort of the general tab, uh, where we have more specific ones for our projects. Uh, and the first one there is a generic graph. And within uh, Jacobs, uh, we call our quality assurance process graph, uh, which stands for check, review, approve, and verify. Uh, and it's sort of a, a tick list uh, um, that we go through, or shall I say, um, four individuals go through to ensure that each uh, deliverable we produce um, meets uh, the correct standards. We also have um, sort of other stamps that relate to um, uploading it to different other software packages. So there's a project mapper there for those that might be aware of that software. Uh, we've also got um, ones relating to if they need to be added to specific registers or spreadsheets. So we have a design decisions uh, spreadsheet for every project and we also have a risk register uh, which can be raised. And sorry, I, I forgot to mention, but Safety Web would also uh, fall and sort of add into to other uh, software packages. Um, so within this, we, we found we went for a more simpler approach uh, because we thought if we, we, we could have customized it um, to, to the point where people might look at it and just go, I, I, I don't know what that means. I don't know what that does. Um, but we, we wanted to encourage them to use it. So we thought if we sort of keep a standard set of stamps uh, to six, six are the same uh, as a starting point. And then as we sort of develop our template with the discipline teams using them, that we would, uh, that we would develop new stamps uh, in later versions of the templates or uh, as the projects proceed, uh, we can add in uh, stamps as we go. Um, so just sort of uh, within Revista, we can have different permission levels. Um, so you can limit, you can grant people uh, a certain level of access. And from that, uh, we sort of aligned ours um, to a standardized approach. So for those, again, that might be aware project wise, you can have um, different permission levels So you can have an originator um, uh, which basically they they offer the models or drawings or documents and they they sort of can create an issue uh, they can upload um, documents within into Revisto itself uh, through the various tools so um, we've been highways uh, projects we we mainly use um, AutoCAD Civil 3D and within that we've got a there's a direct plugin uh, for Revista which can export it as um, as a 3D model or as 2D sheets, uh, depending on what your model contains. Um, 
those those sort of features that the originator will will use. They'll they'll be the ones uh, using the export features and and bringing the uh, models directly into Revista. Our next view, uh, so we have our, our checker functions and uh, we also have reviewers. And these are sort of our, our following our, our quality assurance process where they, um, they, uh, sorry, they uh, check the models or review them uh, depending on their, their role within, within the, the uh, workflow. And they can uh, comment on the issues, uh, create the issues or, or close out the issue depending on whether um, they deem it passes or not. And then the approver is sort of our, our project managers uh, and they will uh, be the ones to sort of either approve the final final uh, crab of a drawing or they'll, they'll be the ones that will um, decide which um, clashes that are brought in from Navisworks uh, will be, will be um, uh, remained open or, or be closed out before the uh, uh, clash detection detection session is um, start, started. And then um, uh, what we call um, our BIM team within Jacobs, we call we call ourselves digital delivery, and that basically we have a separate role for ourselves, where we we um, bar um, changing. Uh, stamps, uh, the stamp templates, uh, we can go in and, and allow ourselves to, to amend models if we need, uh, as we'll be there sort of as, as the, the managers and the, the, the caretakers of the Revista project and all and the data that's inside it. Uh, I think I'll take this opportunity to just uh, jump into one of the projects and I can actually show you. So uh, as I previously mentioned, we had a um, uh, our first sort of clash detection meeting uh, within uh, Jacobs for our RDP project, and this is uh, Scottswood North Brunton, uh, located up uh, in Newcastle, and uh, you can see here that we've got our different elements brought in from our different model, our different disciplines. So we've got pavements, uh, we've got fencing, uh, we've got drainage, signage, road markings, and there's uh, some technology with the road lighting in there. Uh, one thing that we we utilised within within our um, ID IDC session, which is what we call our clash detection meetings, uh, is that we we flew through the model, and we were able to identify sort of rogue. Uh, uh, bits, uh, uh, rogue elements of the model. Uh, so if there's something uh, graphically not right, uh, it was highlighted and the way that was done was uh, through the use of the stamps. So if I go into, uh, everything's going so fine. If I go into the issue tracker uh, and then expand. So we've used some of the stamps here. Uh, and then, so, if I go to can I find it now? So, so I'll, I'll sort of go with this one. So when the um, when the um, the project managers were flying through the model and the discipline leads, uh, this was sort of identified that it was too high above above the surface uh, and it's a uh, I think it is a drainage um, uh, chamber uh, so uh, a stamp was placed um, using the stamps in the top here uh, so I believe the one that was used was under the drainage discipline and uh, it was the level of detail that was used and needed so it was uh, placed down and then it was um, Assigned to the relevant, it was assigned to the relevant um, originator or discipline lead, and from that the discipline lead will um, sort of delegate it to whoever uh, needs to amend the source model. So in this case, I believe 
um, the drainage has come from um, Civil 3D uh, via uh, another software package. But that's sort of how, how we've used the stamps within, uh, within Revista. I, I'll just go back to the presentation. Hopefully I'll be able to uh, close my slide. There we go. So uh, uh, as, as shown in the timeline at the start, we um, uh, developed workflows. Uh, so we uh, made um, four separate workflows, and I think one, and one of them was um, split into two parts. Uh, so for the first, we have one uh, relating to project creation. This is just sort of aid, uh, aid our, our, our digital delivery team in how we create uh, the projects, because um, through the use of our standard template, we can, our, we can import settings such as the stamps and, um, and the tags. Uh, we don't have many tags set up as a predetermined for each project, uh, but we do, we, once a project is created, we uh, preload it with um, location codes, uh, which are, are zones um, that are relevant to, to the individual pro projects. Uh, we also have uh, one shown our civil uh, revit export to Revista, um, just again to, to aid aid those that, that are the originators. Uh, and as, as shown here, we our, our craft process um, sort of detailed out a bit more. Uh, so we have our our discipline teams uh, prepare the models either in the native software packages. Uh, such as um, Civil 3D or Revit, uh, that's then exported to Revisto, and we have, um, as you saw previously, a, a CRAV stamp, which we would place on the model, and the originator of of the uh, the model uh, would place the stamp and change the assignee uh, to whoever will be checking it, and then if the checker uh, deemed the uh, the model possible, uh, they then change the assignee to the reviewer, and then the, if the reviewer found it uh, acceptable, they'd change it to the approver, and the approver uh, would have the final say as to whether the model is ready to be um, sort of um, shared at a project level, and they'd change the stamp out to solved, and that would be um, uh, noted uh, in our uh, CDE, um, and it would be put to a shared state. And then uh, sort of final um, workflow that we have is for our IPCs, uh, which is inter interdisciplinary clash sessions, um, or, or more simply is our clash detection meetings. Uh, and we have one for um, pre-IDC. Uh, so when the discipline teams need to prepare models, uh, get them into Revisto and what other, state, other stages they need to do, because uh, currently, uh, we still use Navisworks to do our clash detection. Uh, so the discipline teams also have to um, output a separate file, which then gets um, sent uh, to a member of our digital delivery team, who will then um, run uh, the different clash tests within Navisworks, and that would also get export. That would then get exported um, to the project. So we, we took we took the approach of how taking the geographical data directly from uh, the source file and then bring in the clash data from Navisworks. Uh, so, we, so we have two sort of separate sources. And then we also have uh, the workflow for during the IDC and sort of post IDC. Uh, and they are the, the sort of, if the clashes are defined uh, and solutions uh, they'll be uh, captured within the um, issue tracker um, for the clashes. And then we've got uh, three separate options uh, which uh, relate to, to sort of three possible outcomes uh, of an IDC. And I'll again just take this opportunity to go into the model and show you the sort of clash detection um, that came through. Uh, so uh, if I go to 
right? So uh, I think uh, Tim uh, managed to show a screenshot of it last time, uh, just as it, uh, in his presentation. But these are sort of the, the clashes that come through um, from Navisworks. And they sort of they, they are brought in as issues, and we can assign these to um, different people, and we can also tag them uh, with separate tags. We can add different watches. Uh, but if I more specifically within Revista, you can bring for your different. Um, you can filter by your different tests that you've done in Navisworks. So within this, we've got um, drainage for suspension, drainage for lighting, uh, fencing versus road restraint. And if we click on these, we can see what what individual ones filter on, uh, from each test. And uh, as you can see here, some are assigned to different users uh, because they've already been delegated by their discipline lead. Um, and you can see sort of in the screenshot at the side how it's, uh, it highlights the, the two models that are, are colliding with each other. And we sort of um, allow the discipline teams to sort of go away and have discussions with themselves how they'd resolve that. Uh, so in this case, the um, drainage pipe there uh, uh, might be lifted or lowered uh, to avoid clashing with the lighting duct um, or vice versa. Uh, so I'll just finish off with uh, what training we've been uh, doing for, for our, our discipline teams. Um, so we've, as I said before, we've got two different types of training. Uh, we have a, a, an overview session, which is given uh, to uh, all the project team, uh, which normally is about 40 users. Um, and that's uh, a quick hour, a quick one hour introduction to the software, really briefly going over all the tools and highlighting uh, what the function functionalities are and how they can um, bring uh, models and drawings into, into each of their projects. But we then sort of our next phase of training was to have uh, interactive training sessions uh, where we sort of specified uh, different user groups uh, and we sort of split them into digital delivery. Uh, so our, our BIM team, um, our originators, so who will be um, exporting the models and drawings into Revisto and uh, the general users. Uh, so the ones who will be using sort of the generic tools like how to comment on issues, create issues, uh, reassign them um, and, and sort of turn on and off different models so they can review just theirs or they can review their model against uh, another discipline's model. So we, we sort of took that approach and we've had some uh, positive feedback um, over the past, I think we've been running them for about a month now. And we've had some positive feedback and we've had some really good interaction from the project teams. Uh, and I just want to say thank you for listening. Great stuff, thanks Josh. Let's have a look at a couple of questions. So yeah, really interesting session today to to look at two completely different types of projects, but mm -hmm. it's interesting to see that the use of the platform is helping both businesses, I suppose, effectively communicate, collaborate, and coordinate project-based tasks in a, a leaner, more digital way, right? So um, the, the challenges are, are very similar, even though that you're, you're designing completely different assets there. So that's great. Th thank you very much, Josh. A uh, couple of questions. So somebody mm -hmm. has talked about uh, drawing review in infrastructure projects. I don't know if you're reviewing drones as well in some of your projects. I know that Tim yeah. uh, pulled up a couple of drones. I don't know if there are any in that project. I think it's uh, uh, so or not. I can open up a separate project and just show, show an example of what we yeah, it's good to see that because I think people can relate then to mm. to that, you know, rather than so, a, you know an architectural floor plan. If you've got something that is infrastructure related, then great. Yeah, so so we more overlay. So we've we've we um, tested with our overlays um, with the two D three D overlay, uh, mm -hmm. but more for the um, sort of uh, geographical layout. So uh, with the okay. little uh, greenhouse at the bottom, I think. Got the nickname of the little monopoly box. <laughs> uh, oh, I like that one. As as you can see there, it's it sort of overlays directly onto onto our model, and um, uh, we can see where where sort of the 
retaining, uh, sorry, not retaining, um, the uh, drainage ponds will be, uh, yeah. even though it's not modelled within a drawing, we can still um, see that uh, as with the overlay. Uh, so we, we, are, we are doing um, model, um, sorry, drawing reviews as well. Perfect. So we just um, don't have an example yet. <laughs> Yeah, not every project, but it's great to see that, that the principles are exactly the same. Mm. 2D, 3D, doesn't really matter. Everything is mm. in one place here, right? So um, yeah. the other question that came up, I think, one to, to you both, actually, is reality capture data. We've seen a lot of interest in that. And somebody's asked, have you tried bringing in point cloud data? Um, I've been in all of the sessions you've had with Peter, but I don't know if you've discussed that. You know, I don't know any drone surveys, point clouds, and that's maybe... Uh, not yet. So uh, we we are um, looking at bringing in um, GIS data. Um, okay. Sort of a few queries from our, our discipline teams as to how that can be brought into Revisto, and mm -hmm. I think we've come to the solution of um, it can be brought in as a BCF file possibly. Mm -hmm. um, so we've, we we are we are exploring that as well. Yep. So and to sort of further extend on that, we can import a wide range of file formats so directly from. A recap uh, through Navisworks Revit, but we, we can bring in lots of different file formats natively. And that could be point cloud, uh, drone survey, 360 photos, that there's, a, there's a, a wide range of information that you can bring through. And as, as Tim mentioned, look at that on, uh, on a tablet. So great stuff. Thanks, Josh. We, we're running shy on time, so we're, we're pretty much on the button. That's great. Thanks to both of our speakers. We do like to finish up our, our rev ups with a a bit more information on what we've got coming in version five, which has been mentioned a few times, Lewis. So maybe you can give us a, a five minute teaser, if, if we may, or you know, whatever we want to call it today. I know you have some ideas. So over to you, know, you to, to show us some of the perfect. things we can expect. So yeah, so I'm not going to deep dive too much into Revisto 5. Um, in this session, we are short on time. So I just want to show you some of the really useful kind of like new features that are coming. Um, and also sort of touch a little bit on what Tim was talking about with yeah. now with the ability to we can color objects a lot more um, detailed than we had um, previously in, in Revisto. So um, first thing I want to show you, um, the object tree has been completely re um, sort of designed and it, and it works a lot better now than it does um, previously. Um, but one really useful feature we now got is um, spend a lot of time with models and, and you click on something and you realize that for example, we've now got insulation around all the all the components in the MEP model. So you can't actually see the data that you want to see for the actual pipes or the actual duct. So really easily now what we can do in the search bar in the object tree, we can just type into here insulation. It finds all the cases of insulation in the project. And we've now got a hide button. So we can hide that. So now straight away, we're now actually clicking on the pipe information. We're clicking on the duct information. We're not actually seeing the insulation around it. So using this search bar along the top, really easy to, to sort of um, get down into the, the detail and, and hide out information that you don't want to um, actually see. So that's a really useful kind of um, feature. Um, following on from this, um, talking about uh, how Tim was sort of mentioning about the chilled water and hot water and that sort of stuff. We've now got find items in here so we can add a condition um, and you don't need to know what you're looking for. We can just type into here things like system classification. Um, so I can select that. We can then pick um, cold water, for example, and I can find all. Find all, it's found some. So I will save that as a search set. We've then got cold water. We can do the same here for hot water. So we can swap that around and find all and it will find all the hot water. So we can save that as a search set. And then very simply using the information we've got down here, we can select this and we can um, do a color override. So we can select all the, co uh, the hot water to be red. And then we've got our cold water, which we can override again. We can override the color and make all of that kind of blue so i'm not sure where the hot water was and maybe it's not actually in this model um but you can see that it's really easy now to sort of set colors up for for different items that you've got within um within the model just by searching and i find items you can find all the cold water hot water and set those up um another really useful new feature using that object tree if i turn everything back on again sometimes you've got a component in your model and you, you, you know its size but you don't know where it actually sits so for example we can now search in here for a 610 uv 
and it will highlight, so it's told me that it's found it, so we can then isolate that in transparency, and straight away we can now see the instant, like the instance where that actually exists. So on a drawing, you might see a, like a, a beam size or something like that, and you want to know where that sits in the model. We can now just search for that information in our search bar um, and just pull that out really quickly, really easily. We now know where that is, so we know it does actually exist, um, and we can feed that information back to anyone that was asking. So um, the object tree, has been really improved to be a lot more sort of interactive and and the way that you work with it is a lot more sort of user friendly anything you want to search for um you can just put it into here so we can do we can look for um switches and all of a sudden we find anything with like switch and in there we can do um different just different options and again we can just isolate all these out in um transparency and we can all of a sudden see all the different um switches in the model uh so yeah the object tree is, is really really easy to use and, and really allows you to sort of um, go into that detail. So I said like with the, the stuff that Tim was talking about, you can use the, the object tree or you can use find items to pull out all that information. Um, so there's all of our domestic cold water. So again, we can now isolate that out. And again, using my search sets, we can now change the color of the cold water in here to be blue. And that's now applied that to, to there. So we can then save those colors as, as viewpoints and, and things like that inside Revisto and you can easily just switch them on and off. So um, yeah, that was just a, a quick tease about kind of the object tree and the, the cert sets. I'm conscious of time, so I don't want um, to spend Lewis, too much um, time. But it's, uh, more to come. So uh, yeah, if you've dialed into any of our previous web ups and you'll start to see these sessions. So that's just a sneak peek of what's coming and we aren't too far away from that. So really excited to, to get version five into the, the hands of Josh and, and Tim and, and hopefully show you all that work in, in, in the real life project soon. So with that said, uh, I'd like to, to thank firstly all of our speakers for today's session. Really interesting seeing those various projects using Revisto. Lewis for showing us around version five. I mean, uh, if anyone has any questions, then now's the time to ask. We've run over slightly, so that's fine, but we can take any questions that there are. So if I just show my uh, screen just for a second, we can take some questions and I'd just like to, to let anyone know on the call that maybe not a Revisto client and wants to try some of the things that, that have been demonstrated today, then give it a go, just get in touch. We can give you access to a, a full, full trial for you and the project team that myself and my colleagues can help you with. So if you are interested, then just get in touch and uh, we'll help get that set up for you. So again, thanks for everybody for listening today and ask away if there are any questions, we'll hold on for a few minutes, watch for any questions that come through. And yeah, if, if you don't have any questions, thank you to our audience for dialing in from, from all over the world today. It's been really interesting to see where you've, you've dialed in from to, to watch the session. And we'll see you all in another rev up soon. Take care. Thank you very much.